Hello, everyone. Welcome to the panel discussion, <coughs> Making It in Children's Wear. Thank you all for taking the time out to be here today. My name is Francesca Samaritano. I'm assistant professor here at Parsons, as well as a Parsons alumni. My journey into the children's wear market began in women's wear. It later transitioned into the kids sector as more and more companies felt it important to be developing a kids line in addition to their women's wear or men's wear collections. Employees who are at the stage of having kids or are surrounded by friends and family who do want to dress their children in the latest fashions. The children's wear market is an area of the fashion industry, I believe, to always be thriving. Each individual brand's growth follows a variety of trajectories that range from a small neighborhood boutique to international established fashion brands all either focus on children's wear or represent the category in addition to various other categories. A fun fact is that in children's wear, the customer does not shop for themselves, at least not until they reach the mature age of tweens. <laughs> Although some will develop the skill even earlier, some, par some parents can confirm this. I would now like to begin our discussion by introducing my colleague, Kalitha Crawford, children's wear design consultant and specialist. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm very excited to welcome you here along with Francesca. Both of us have a soft spot for children's wear. Uh, we love this industry and we definitely wanted to do another panel like this, which we did a few years ago because we like to try to recruit to children's wear. We know that a lot of our design students that come to Parsons come with the idea of being children, uh, uh, women's evening wear designers. And for some of them, they'll continue on that path, but we at least want to give information about what this industry is all about, introduce the fact that it is very fashionable and can be very fast and that you don't have to sacrifice any of that if you were interested in working in children's wear. And the nice thing about it is that, you know, in this industry, it's a little bit uh, more of a smaller community and a little bit, I would say, maybe a little nicer maybe than women's and men's wear. <laughs> so those are things to consider as you're trying to figure out exactly where you want to go after you graduate and the type of life style ultimately that you want to lead so you know it could be that children's wear could be for you or maybe you'll remember this years from now when you have your first baby and you start to think about starting a children's line after your years in men's or women's wear so we're excited to have you here today we're also very excited to have our panel all of our industry friends and colleagues who will give you the inside scoop on what it's like to work in children's wear. And we specifically picked a mix of different backgrounds because we wanted you to hear from designers, but we also wanted you to hear from people that are in the sales or marketing or other sides of the business as well. Um, also, those that work in large firms and those that might have small companies or middle-sized companies or large companies that they've grown on their own. So you can get that perspective as well. So first, I will introduce the panel. Starting at the far end, we have Nicole Yi. She's the children's editor for Style Site, and her job entails creating runway and trade show reports that focus on the key colors and prints and patterns and graphics that come out each season. She works with clients such as Target, Disney, and Gap Kids as they are doing their research phase each season, pulling their collections together. Lisa Dinopoli is Vice President of Children's Wear at Tommy Hilfiger. She is a Parsons graduate, and she has been in Children's Wear for about 15 years, and she's worked with other companies such as Best & Co. and Baby Gap. And she even had her own label, which won an Ernie Design Award and um, was sold at Barney, Sachs, and Neiman's. Next, we have Sian Batesh, who is Executive Vice President of Licensing and Marketing at Parigi. And Parigi produces collections under the Puma 
DKNY, Nicole Miller, Heartstrings, and many more, many other labels as well. And Sion kind of is responsible for the whole life cycle. So part of his job is to identify brands that they might bring to Parigi, as well as fostering those brands all the way through the design and ultimately the marketing and advertising at the stores. Charlotte Guess is a freelance designer with 15 years of experience in the industry. She has worked for Baby Togs, designing collections such as Nicole Miller, O'Neill, and Dr. Seuss. She's also been the design director for Lucy Sykes, director of sales for Cynthia Rowley, and director of retail at Lulu Guinness in London. Lynn Hussam, along with her husband, Harold, co-founded Man, which is a label that many of you might know. It encompasses boys, girls, and baby. And the line is kind of based on Harold's upbringing in Norway, but it definitely has the urban feel of living in New York City. And her roles there primarily focus on merchandising, creative direction for the girls' collection, social media, and marketing. Bronna Staley owns the Sweet William Boutiques. She operates two locations, and the charming stores are upscale and are known for really kind of embracing emerging designers. She, her, in the past, she was a uh, fashion editor for magazines such as the New York Times Tea Magazine, as well as Cookie Magazine, which you all probably know as a lifestyle magazine for families. And Lynn Meyer. Lynn Meyer owns the Lynn Meyer Showroom. She opened the showroom in 1990, and she has a whole slate of labels, including Wheat, Disagual, Charlie Rocket, Wes and Willie, Flap Happy, and Bose Arts. And she was formerly a buyer at Bloomingdale's in the Layette department and Lord & Taylor for both infants and then women's designer dresses. So let's welcome our panel. So before we dive into each of your specific roles in the industry, let's talk about the industry as a whole, as it is right now. Um, Nicole, I'm going to put you on the spot <laughs> first. Um, I would like to get your feedback on Fall 14, because we were all just kind of ra wrapping up the Fall 14 selling season. And in your job, you get the opportunity to travel to different shows and see a lot of different uh, collections. So what was your overall impression? Was it a strong season? Um, yes, I think fall, winter 14 uh, for children's wear is always, to me, the more exciting season. Um, there's a lot of, you know, fabrics, cool prints and patterns, um, and just, you know, in terms of more items, there's just more layering pieces uh, to play with. So I think, you know, the biggest takeaway is I continually see uh, more gender neutral items for children with every season, you know. Uh, eight years ago when I started, you definitely could see, you know, this is definitely girl, this is definitely boy. And now when I'm looking, you know, at images that I've taken or our correspondents have taken, uh, a lot of times we're like, oh, is this girl? Is this boy? And sometimes we'll just, you know, tag it as both. So in terms of, you know, silhouettes, colors, even prints and patterns, there's definitely more of, you know, a boy girl. Uh, and just like really cool updates to prints and patterns. I always feel like camo and animal is here to stay. So it's really interesting to see how designers are, you know, making it fresh and new because it just comes back season after season. So it's now more about, you know, how can we make giraffes look like camo or how can we, you know, work in, uh, you know, stripes in a new way or create a texture with a print as opposed to, you know, using an ac actual, like, chunky yarn that a kid will spill on and get dirty. So, yeah. And I'm going to jump in here, and I'm going to credit Nicole with the uh, boy-girl. We used to work together, <laughs> and when she was a, f a fashion editor, and she would put together her looks, and I'd say, Nicole, is that for a girl or a boy? And we would always say... <laughs> Oh, it works, it works. <laughs> had a so lot I'm of crying boys at photo shoots. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Um, so uh, Lynn, for Oppa Man, can you tell us a little bit about how you're able to continue to push design forward, as Nicole was talking about, but hit on a lot of those things that mom is concerned with, quality and price? Um, I mean, when we design a collection, we try and stay away from trend because fast fashion kind of comes and goes so we are always looking into the marketplace of what 
kind of works and is um, kind of a classic. And then we usually take that classic and try and make it, bring it down to kids and then think about moms in the way of like, should there be snaps or zippers or how is this going to be easy for her? But our sweet spot is really like two to eight. And so we're not always fumbling with like the baby stuff, but we're definitely thinking about those elements when you're thinking about toddler in like two, three, four. And then always kind of going back to keeping, we have like a specific price point and we really do our best to stay within that and, and not raise prices from season to season, but try and stay pretty standard on how we feel Apman falls in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And Lisa, can you add um, and talk about how designing for a label like Tommy Hilfiger that has a very specific aesthetic and people know it for certain things, how you're able to keep it fresh each season but stay within that aesthetic? It's a great question because um, when I interview potential candidates for the design team, I always say we design in a very small box and our challenge is to make that box look new every single season. So. I know that uh, Nicole just said that camo and animal skins, or animal, animal prints are always, are here to stay. Tommy, they're a no. <laughs> 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 they were like, don't go near that. We presented camo last season because we know it's super on trend for boys. And the merchants, they let us put it in. We'll see, the, we'll see the prototype, but I'm sure it won't get into the line. So the way that we get to push the envelope forward is to really, really dive into who our customer is and who that classic American or the person who wants to look like a classic American thinks and try to push it a little bit forward, whether it's color, changing that classic silhouette a little bit. And it's, it's really those small pushes, those small details that push our, our line forward. Okay. Color, pattern, print, that everything that, but maybe the silhouette is the same. So really trying to fit it still into the box, but make it look new and different. Right, thank you. And Sian, um, on that topic of a brands, since it is your job to bring the big brands to Parigi Group, can you speak a little bit to the power of brand in children's wear and if it's as powerful as it has been in the past? Mm. Mm. Brands, uh, brands add value and brands build self-esteem I mean, there's a lot of good things it brings, right, to adults and to kids. You know, sometimes without brands, price is no bottom in our market, right? So a T-shirt's a T-shirt, a jean's a jean. But I think a brand can really, I mean, it makes a kid feel a part of something bigger than just wearing clothes. Because big brands, Lisa's a part of a major one, when you're a global brand that has a certain definition of either a time and place or a certain look, or a certain lifestyle, and I think even young kids want to be a part of it. Maybe not, you know, in the two to five or two to six age, but they get to that tween age, I think it's really important. So for them, I think it's a, it's a statement for them, either of something that they've accomplished or something that they feel is a badge of honor. So the responsibility with getting a good brand is, is making sure you stay true to it, right? You've got to stay authentically true to the heritage of the brand and the responsibility is staying consistent to that every season and it's hard. So trends come and go. I mean, giraffes work sometimes. Um, sometimes they don't, but I think trends in general are available to everybody. And kids, I think all of us have the responsibility of finding out what's really applicable to kids, right? So, I mean, the market, you know, Nicole said they could be, you know, 20 trends that are going around globally, right? And some are applicable to men's and women's, some are applicable to juniors and young men's, some to luggage, some to other categories, but there's a finite amount of trends that might work in kids. And then when you're representing a brand, you're gonna have to be particular on how you translate it and what works for that brand. And that's a big thing. So if you do that the right way, I think you not only keep the customer, but there's extra value when it's sold at retail. Mm -hmm. And that consistency for a brand is really important. So we will have uh, Lynn Meyer speak to this because Lynn, you have uh, several brands in your showroom and I know that you are committed to your brands and sometimes though for se from season to season, their look might change. And how does that affect your ability to sell the brand if it's not consistent while still moving forward fashion wise? Well, that makes it a challenge, doesn't it? <laughs> 
Um, usually, though, most brands um, have the ability to know who they are and what their customers expect from them. So there is usually a level of consistency. Sometimes seasonality goes, plays, comes into play. Um, you have a stronger spring or a stronger fall uh, in terms of the looks of the garments. But you know, when you think about it, in, in, our, in our showroom, we have everything from hair bows and shoes to clothing collections. So it's, it is a challenge. And I think that's what makes it all very interesting. Mm -hmm. um, and it's kept me doing it for as long as I have been. But uh, it, in terms of that, uh, yes, that is a challenge, and that is something we look at every season. And we know right away when it comes in, gee, this is going to be a great line. So you know, that's kind of how it works. We'll speak to that, gee, we know it's going to be a great line. So what right now is kind of selling really well for <laughs> What did well for you for fall 14? Are there any things that you can kind of point to that are meat and potatoes right now? Sure, sure. Um, I think that. Um, it is uh, the strong brands in the, in the room uh, have really, really carried us through a period where we were a little more challenged with selling for this fall than some other falls might, might have been for us. Um, we're not allowed to blame weather. We're not allowed to blame anything. But we all know it really does come into play. And so, um, yeah, I know. <laughs> so, so there it is out on the table. It was not the easiest of fall seasons. And so, uh, you know, it, our, our, our strong brands in the room really carried us. Um, the newness in the room uh, added interest. And, um, you know, that was, that was hard to do, was to raise people to a level of being interested when they were coming off of a soft selling period. So, yeah, um, I, I think there, it went two ways. Okay. And Brona, you are dealing day in and day out with mom and other consumers. Can you speak to what you're really hearing from them as their chief concerns and questions? Um, let's see. Uh, I mean, I feel like when, <clears throat> when customers come in and they're shopping for their kids, they're obviously concerned about um, how well a garment functions. And if we're speaking specifically about fall and winter, you know, how well the coat functions, how well it zips up, it does it zip up, does it button. Um, that's always a big concern. Just um, also around the toddler age accessibility, you know, they, they need to get the children to the bathroom fast, you know, and designing pants and trousers and dungarees, that kind of thing. That's always a concern also. Um, so that transition. Um, yeah. Okay. And as I mentioned, you um, always are on the lookout for new brands. What, what about a brand might spark your, spark your interest? Um, well, for me personally, I um, don't really follow trends at all. And when I opened my store seven years ago, I never, pr prior to that, I had been a fashion editor and I didn't bring in, I don't carry um, mainstream brands. I always you know, um, went on my intuition and what I thought of something when I saw it. And it didn't matter if it was trendy or what. I didn't really base my um, judgment, on, base my decisions on that. Um, and I, I feel like Sweet William has really been, um, has enabled a lot of uh, brands to grow and to grow in America. Like I've brought in a lot of Scandinavian lines, a lot of European lines that I was the first person to bring them into the country and start selling them. And then, for example, lines like, um, which I don't carry anymore, but Mini Rodini, um, that, that kind of blew up into a big line. Um, Bobo Shows, which is a Spanish line, and it was one of, I was one of the first Americans to carry Bobo Shows. Um, so I, I really go on gut. You know, and that's that's what I go on. I don't go on trend. I go on, do I like it or do I not, do I not like it? And I also think me being a parent really comes into it. Also, you know, I look for the things that function um, in a garment. You know, because I have kids myself, and I think that's really um, that's fundamental mm -hmm. to apply your own um, experience with children um, when you're buying. And on that topic, Charlotte, you're also a mom so, um, and a designer. So talk about how being a mom kind of informs your designs maybe differently than before you were a mom. Absolutely. I mean, um, before I was a mom, I worked on a children's line called Lucy Sykes Baby, who did beautiful dry clean only um, outfits. <laughs> 
we had buttons down the back. And then when I had my daughter, I realized, oh my goodness, what was I doing to these poor parents? And now I work primarily um, zero to 24 months with a lot of clients that are making, trying to make products to make life easier for the parents. Like I work with um, a great new brand called Bell and Beanza and she does an elastic back panel um, so it's super quick and easy to change your baby. You can change them in the car seat. And it's all about function and the feeling of the garment. Um, I do another uh, item called a Zen Swaddle, which is like a weighted swaddle. And it won um, the Design Initiative Award. It, it helps the baby sleep because it feels like it's being held. And it's also in a beautiful Pima cotton. Um, it feels like a really great quality for the parent. Um, and that helped with me not having children, you know, that didn't sleep, I knew the kind of things that parents needed and uh, it definitely changed the way I design, design products. Okay. Yeah. And just show of hands on the panel, since we're really here to talk about your career paths and to give some advice to the students on, you know, what's available to them and how to get there, how many of you are in the job or the career function that you started out, you know, in school thinking that you would follow? Anyone exactly doing what you thought you'd do? <laughs> I just wanted to point that out because I know that, you know, when you come to school, you have certain things in mind that you think you want to do. And for some of you, your career path will be very linear and straight and you'll do exactly that. And others of you will explore other avenues because you have other interests or life, you know, comes and, and gets in the way or however it happens. Um, so, but it's, it's, it's a good thing. And so I think now is a good time for you to practice kind of keeping your eyes open and looking at opportunities and possibilities. And that's why we have the panel today. So we're going to dive into kind of a bit more of what each of you do in terms of your day to day. Um, so Lisa, let's start with you actually, because I think maybe a lot of our students have the dream of exactly what you did in terms of starting a label. And so I'd love to have you speak to kind of the realities of that and maybe what you might have done differently now in hindsight. Um, I would have used other people's money to start my company. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that's the most honest answer I can give. Um, it was a long time ago when I started my company, but I did it on, you know, $3,000 of credit card debt and, and a lot of hard work and struggle. Um, but it was a passion of mine. And I, I, had, I had started in women's wear, as most people at Parsons at that time did. There was really no other op You weren't even taught anything else. Um, and then in between jobs, I, I, someone sent me on a freelance assignment in the Children's Wear building, which we were just discussing, doesn't even exist anymore, but, mm -hmm. and I saw this whole world of children's clothing, and I, and I went in, and this woman, I actually had my portfolio with me, and didn't, the job that I went for, I didn't want, but I knocked on a door. I mean, randomly, I was just like, oh, let me just see what's going on in here, and I knocked on a door, and it was this dress company, and the woman gave me an assignment. I mean, she gave me an assignment to design a line of dresses, like sight unseen. I was like, here's my portfolio. She says, here, come back in you know, two weeks, give me a line of dresses. And I thought, this is a great world. Like, there's so much here, there's so much here. And, and I really enjoyed it. And then, um, and then I was you know, then hired by a mass, mass market children's wear uh, company. And it was, no offense, it was one of the worst experiences of my life. And, and I just was like, this is not what, what I wanted to do. I mean, this is, this is I, I just don't enjoy this at all. But, but I was smart enough to, they sent me out, uh, they were doing, they had a, some kind of assignment for our project for Macy's. They had to do that, something. And I went out and they said, we need dresses for Macy's. They're coming in, you know, you gotta go and you know, design these dresses for Macy's. And, half an hour, you know, whatever it was, some ridiculous timeline. And so I went to Macy's and I went to, you know, Bloomingdale's and I went to all the big stores and I looked around and I thought, these dresses are horrible. These are, and I, you know, I was at the age in my 20s where some of my friends were starting to have children. I thought, none of my friends would buy this stuff. It's disgusting. And there's not a, there's not a dress out here that's not a floral print. So I went back and, and started thinking, thinking, thinking about it. I couldn't let it go. And I was just like, you know what? I'm going to do something. I'm going to do something that's not out there. And so I designed a, a line of linen dresses, which, I mean, 
<laughs> not practical at all. I was 20, you know, 25. <laughs> what did I know? But but they were beautiful, and and I wanted to use linen because it was you know Irish linen, and it was like this fabric that's really strong and has this heritage. And I had you know I had a whole story and a motivation, and it, you know, and I and and I did it, and I I designed one dress, three colors. It was a dress and a hat together, and I brought it to Barney's, and I brought it to um, there were some beautiful stores in Soho that were just starting to carry some children's stuff, and I brought it there, and, and everybody gave me a really positive response, but nobody bought it. <laughs> <laughs> but then I did the, the Ian K show, and literally I had a tiny booth with one dress and three colors, and I got an or orders for 200 dresses, and that's how I... And that's how I started, and I didn't. I was like, "Oh, now I have to make these things <laughs> <laughs> with my money." <laughs> and um, yeah, that was that was when the reality set in that this is not not an easy task. But it, but I, you know, I did it. I, you find a way. You make it work. You 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 get out there. You find a pattern maker. You find a grader. You you know find somebody to. Help. I mean, I did the pattern, but you need somebody to grade it. I mean, I had no grading <coughs> skills. You know, you find a cutting room. You know, you're trudging through the garment center <laughs> you, know, you know you do it you make it work and and the goods were all des delivered and they all sold and the next time I had a bigger line and the next time I had an even bigger line and you know and it grew and I did it for for almost a decade so almost 10 years um and then it got to a point and it was you know it was economy it was the timing you know we needed to take it to the next level we were selling to about 600 specialty stores in the U.S. and that's that's about all that could carry the price point that we were offering for a special occasion, dr mostly dresses for, for girls. Um, and we needed to take it to the next level, and we just could not find an investor. At that point, my brother had become my business partner. We had moved the company up to Rhode Island, and uh, it was 1998. What was the company called? H.M. Wogglebug. I think I met your husband yeah, yeah. at the trade show. <laughs> um, and, you know, it, you, Every investor we went to said, "This is a great story. It's fantastic. We're going to invest in a dot com company." You know, so <laughs> so we, you know, the reality was, I was paying my employees more than I was paying myself, and you know, my brother looked at me and he said, "You you could be making a lot of money designing for somebody else. You know, you really should you really should just throw in the towel." And I fought it tooth and nail, but but I did. And you know what? I learned so much, and I and 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 I achieved so much, and I created a great thing, and I created. A great team of people that I worked with, and I met so many uh, wonderful people. And I still have, you know, some of those connections that I made in the children's wear industry from doing those shows at ENK, and mm -hmm. and you know, it was it was fantastic. Mm -hmm. And I'm glad I did it. And um, it was a great time and place in my life, a great chapter that I would never, never, you know, take away. Right. I love that you first, of course, led with you would do it with someone else's money. <laughs> I think that's one of the main things that people sometimes underestimate when they start a line. You know, they don't realize how much money, especially up front, yeah. it really does take. Um, and I like the fact that you also started after having done your research, being actually in the stores and seeing what was there and what you could bring that would be different. I mean, it's crucial. And that's and honest, quite honestly, that's why I haven't done it again. It's like I haven't seen that hole again. And, and maybe that comes to another discussion about the children's market and how it's changed. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's so much more now than there was mm -hmm. 10, 20 years, I mean, whatever, however many years ago. I mean, it's, it's a much more saturated and much yeah. more expansive market mm -hmm. just now than it was. Okay. And on that topic of uh, starting a label and growing a label, Lynn, could you speak uh, to Oppelman, how you got started and what it took to really get from you know, just an idea to where you are today. Yeah. Um, I mean, our story is not so unlike yours. Um, we, um, but I'm a nurse by trade. I was a nurse practitioner, and my husband was a graphic designer, and it was, you know, we were, like, hungover at Vizelka one morning, and we saw this dad and son walk by, and the son was wearing a T-shirt with a teddy bear on it, and the dad was wearing a T-shirt with ACDC on it, and my husband was like, oh, it would be so great if those, the outfits were switched. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we just laughed and went on. And then, like, two weeks later, he was like, I think I'm going to do it. And I was like, do what? <laughs> and, he, <laughs> and he was like, I'm going to make T-shirts for kids that are interesting and, you know, like little mini-me kind of designs that a dad would buy. Because my husband has, like, 7,000 T-shirts. And he, with his graphics background, 
he thought, you know, I can do this. So he took a screen printing class at the new school and he started screening in our kitchen. We lived in a 600 square foot apartment in Brooklyn, throwing dye batches in our washing machine, like drying <laughs> rainbow onesies all over our house. And we had no idea what we were doing. I, I was still working and he, and he registered the company. We got a, you know, the name is, um, my husband had a little toy when he was a, a little stuffed monkey that he took everywhere. And so we were like lying in bed one night and we're like, well, it has to be named Appaman. I mean, he's been with us, you know, he's been with you forever and he's been everywhere with us. And so um, he like came up with the logo, it's Appaman's face and then, you know, registered all that. And then we, I went to my boss and basically said, I need to take a maternity leave without a baby. And she was like, okay, that's an interesting thing. And I was like, different kind of baby. Yeah. And so we, but this was more like um, kind of just like clear our heads before we jump in. And so we took off for three months to South America and traveled all around. And the only rule was we couldn't talk about this venture we were going to start as soon as we got back. So we kind of cleared our heads and came home. Um, we came home at the end of March, launched the company at the end of April, and we were pregnant by the end of May. <laughs> so it was um, a huge new chapter in our life. And Harold, he made all the garments, like I said, in our house. He went door to door down in Soho. He got a great response. I mean, he's six foot four Norwegian man selling baby clothes. It was like, you know, slam dunk. And, um, and then after, and then I, and I had taken a class at um, a night class that was called marketing to the children's wear industry and I was star pupil I did everything they said and it worked and I was you know on my lunch hour I was sitting on the floor of Barnes and Noble looking through the mastheads of every magazine finding like oh she sounds like a nice Jewish girl I'll send it to her <laughs> and then I was make I made press kits like use like mylar paper and sent out these like interesting looking press kits and within two months, we were covered by Rima Suki and Best Bets. And, you know, at the time, like, that was the get to get. And um, then we went to ENK um, in October. So we launched the company in April and went to our first ENK in October. And we were so, you know, we used all our own money. <laughs> and it felt like this huge investment. And we didn't really know if we had enough of a line. All we had was, like, probably seven T-shirts. And... But by noon, we broke even, and by the end of the first day, we had a rep in LA. And so we were kind of like, this, maybe this is working. And um, all of our clothing was really bright colors, and you know, we got a lot of press. We had a Che Guevara onesie at the time before anybody had put Che on you know, anything beyond a t-shirt sold on, you know, in Thailand. And then um, we started getting press and getting picked up by kind of better boutiques you know some of our first accounts were like Fred Siegel and Barney's and um, and that just drives sales to other you know people use them as like tastemakers and then other sales came in and so but you know quickly we realized that you we weren't gonna retire on t-shirts alone so then we started getting you know moving into other categories it, you know, the first season we made pants, they didn't fit a human alive. Like they were too long <laughs> and too skinny. And, but you know, everybody was very forgiving and we were always really honest and upfront with our customers and they constantly came back. And, you know, same thing with our t-shirts, they ran and bled into everybody's washing machine. Like, you know, we were using like writ dye in the washing. I mean, we didn't know what we were doing. And so all these mistakes were made in like an innocent moment. And I think it was just, the way my husband and I dealt with the situations with like full honesty and in a very real sense, we mm -hmm. forged these really wonderful relationships that we still have been able to maintain. And the company just kind of kept growing from season to season. And I don't know, it was just kind of all a lot of gut. And, you know, there was some, um, there was definitely we walked into some good situations for sure. Um, um, Angelina Jolie was photographed with her son wearing one of our t-shirts the day she announced that she was pregnant with Brad Pitt's baby. And that was like the photo that went around the world. And so that was a huge, you know, that brought in a ton of international interest and things just started to move a lot quicker. And, you know, we're 11 years in and, um, 
you know, we're still, uh, you know, a very medium size, small company. We have 10 employees. Um, one of our interns is here in the audience. And, um, and our lead designer was a graduate from Parsons, um, very talented, Susan Kay, who was one of Francesca's students. And, um, you know, we all wear a lot of hats and all work together, and it's a real, it's been, a, it's been an absolutely amazing ride. And so 11 years later, would you say it's easier or more difficult at the size that you are now? Um, I mean, it's like we kind of, everything, we took everything at a really kind of almost like baby steps and when we could handle it. We never chased anything. We waited for things to come to us. I mean, I think we made some decisions about marketing and PR and how we want to represent the company at an early point. Mm -hmm. And I think that definitely made all the difference. Right. I think it's very important to stick to who you are and not change season to season and have a real kind of mission and aesthetic and stick to it. And mm -hmm. I think we've done that. Okay. And I mean, at the end of the day, I truly believe it's about being nice and honest. And, um, you know, having the relationships we've had and, you know, we're with the, sa we're extremely loyal as well. We're with the same rep groups we've been with um, pretty much since we started. Our PR people we've been with for eight years. They're incredible. Our manufacturer, she stopped by the booth at our second ENK, introduced herself. We, she took a chance on us, and we took a chance on her, and, you know, we've grown up together. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, we go to our house and make dumplings, and she mm -hmm. comes to our house, and, our, you know, she gets my kids' presents, I get her kids' presents. I mean, we're, right. you know, she's been on the ground in China for, with us for nine years. Okay. Mm -hmm. And it really is about relationships. Mm -hmm. So when I said before about how the industry is nice because it's a smaller industry, um, the flip side is it's a smaller industry. So, you know, even in women's wear, you have to be nice, but you have to really be nice yeah, and on it from a customer service standpoint in, in kids wear because everybody knows everyone. And, you know, if you start burning bridges, they will all go up in flames on you. So yes. you can't have that happen. Um, so, okay, let's switch gear. So, Nicole, why don't you tell us a bit about what exactly a trend forecaster does? How do you know what we're going to be wearing 18 months from now? So my job is essentially it's twofold. One is to inspire people with, you know, dry clean only linen dresses or suits. And then the other part is, you know, what trends really have legs? How are we going to make nautical fresh? Some, you know, a trend in children's wear that definitely probably applies to almost every single tier of the children's wear industry. So we start off, um, with the trade show runway season. So we go and myself and we have correspondents all over the globe. We take photos at all the trade shows. We get photos from all the runway and we go through and pick the trends and you know, colors, prints, patterns, materials, uh, silhouettes. And then we create these huge reports that basically are a, you know, a need to know for that season. And then what I'll do is we'll meet with clients and see, you know, how can we cater this to your particular line? For example, if you always do stripes, you know, how are we changing the stripes? What colors are we going to use? Um, if you always have a polo shirt in spring, summer, what detail can we add uh, to make it fresh? Or, you know, what graphics will work for not only your baby onesie, but how can we translate that to an older boy or even a tween? So it's essentially, you know, it's great because we can be out there with our capsules and be more inspirational, but then we really have to boil it down and make it digestible so people say, yes, I get it. This is what I have to do, and it works for me, and it works for, you know, a mass retailer. So how much of your time is spent in the market and traveling? Um, I travel for about two weeks for each season, so a month total. Um, we do most of the European shows, which are always like clumped right on top of each other. So you're just like a wild like animal <laughs> for like two weeks in January and usually in the summer, so like June, July. Uh, so then, yeah, when I come back from the show, um, there's so many children's trade shows, so it's really just, yeah like going through all that for about trade show reports for about two months and then after that it's you know creating 
um, more uh, like catered projects based on the overarching themes of the season. Mm-hmm. Okay. And Charlotte, um, if you could speak to being a freelancer, because I think most of us think like, sign me up for that gig. You're a freelancer, you work on your own schedule, you pick your own clients, it's fantastic. Is it fantastic? Well, I did, I, uh, I started, I decided to get, be a freelancer after I had my second child because I really wanted to be home with my children. I had a great um, nanny for my first child, but when I had my second, I really decided I wanted to be home. So I, I gave myself a five year period when he started in kindergarten, which is in 18 months time. I wanted to set myself up to see if I could make it freelance. And I started off with one client and I've now got eight. So I'm kind of getting there and all of my clients are are still with me, which is, I think kind of shows that, you know, I'm pretty okay at what I do and uh, they seem to be happy with everything. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I kind of, it is hard. It's it's hard being freelance because you're not guaranteed a paycheck at the end of every month, but, and you suddenly get, um, crazy busy time and then like nothing for a month but you just have to kind of get yourself organized um I work primarily with zero to 24 months so a lot of the (coughs) people that I work with are women um that have decided that they want to set up um their company and they have children so they're we're all flexible you know we have to we work with each other and um I mean I enjoy it I get to get the best of both worlds I get to be creative and still be home with my kids so do you think you would have been as successful as a freelancer getting as many gigs if you had done it right out of school? No, no, no. I've done, I think I've done practically every job in the industry. And I think that you kind of need to because especially working with small companies, you need to be able to know about the retail, the wholesale, the production, the merchandising, you know, and that's how you design a better product. And that's how you can advise the people that are coming to you, you know, how to help their brand be successful. Right. Yeah, I think that's uh, definitely a key is anytime, no matter what industry you find yourself in later in life, anytime you understand kind of the full life cycle and, um, you know, where the money comes from and the major concerns, you're much more valuable if you're an employee, but obviously you're much more valuable to be able to pop in as a freelancer or a consultant to be able to help people with their businesses as well. So, Brana, why don't you tell us a bit about what it's like to be a retailer? What is that day-to-day like? And you came from the magazine world, so I don't know if you had any retail experience prior. Yeah. Um, Well, I definitely didn't. The only retail, the only sales experience I had was um, just working as a waitress when I was in my teens, you know, going through school. Um, uh, so I, yeah, I, I mean, I studied fine art, I studied painting. So I'm definitely, I de- definitely had no idea that this is where I would end up um, owning children's stores, but you know, you never know what's mm-hmm. gonna happen. Um, so when I moved here, I'm, I'm from Ireland, and when I moved here, um, I kind of fell into the fashion industry and worked um, as a fashion editor, uh, as um, Kalitha said, at Tea and at Cookie and, um, I had my son, and I had worked at Cookie for two and a half years, and I went back to work after maternity leave, and I just thought, I'm n- I, ca- I don't want to work at Condé Nast, you know, when I have a child and everything. And my husband and I were bo- both went to art school, both studied painting, and we lived in Williamsburg, and I just said, you know what, let's open a store, because I've made all these connections with all these great designers that... Prior to this, I didn't know we're out there, and there's definitely a niche um, for the kind of store that I have. I mean, the, there's a lot of children's stores out there, and a lot of them are the same, but I just had a certain vision. We both had a vision as to what we wanted to do, and it didn't exist. So um, we opened in Williamsburg, and my husband um, builds out the stores, so they kind of they're really beautiful um, spaces. So that, that the brick and mortar is definitely important for us to have. So we have two retail locations. And in addition to that, we have a website also, and we sell a lot online. Um, so that's kind of part, you know, that does as well as our stores do. Uh, so basically the day-to-day operations, um, you know, the business has obviously grown slowly but steadily. Um, 
I, you know, I have like maybe six staff, um, someone that manages the web, and then people that work in the store. But because it's a small business, we all wear different. You know, we all do. We all do everything. You know, um, I do a lot of um, bossing around, but not, <laughs> not, not in a bad way. I'm just a control freak, and I just ha everything has to be just so. And you know, because I come from an editorial background, I'm really into the. Um, how things are curated and how the store looks, and I'm very picky, but I think that's the only reason why we've been able to, you know, sustain and stay true to what we do, <clears throat> is because I, I've never had anyone do the buying for me. You know, I always do the buying. I would never let anyone else make decisions on the buying. I have to choose every single garment, and some may call it micromanaging, but in reality, it's just, it's kind of what has worked, you know? And then there's also the personalities of the staff. You know, all, a lot of them young girls out of art school like tend to hire a lot of people from, that also went to art school. Um, and, you know, just, it, and also I work with my husband, you know, it's our, it's our business. So it's, that's, and having two children and trying to like um, create boundaries in the house and not talk about the store all the time. That's that's one of the most, um, the biggest challenges that mm -hmm. we come across, you know? So we've had to have set boundaries on those kinds of things, but um, it's definitely grown. We've defi definitely learned a lot and, um, you know, it's enjoyable and it is about customer service. And at the end of the day, it's about pleasing your customers. You know, you just, I think, you know, for us, we have to please our customers. We have to um, make sure that they walk out happy, you know, and we kind of have a, we have a formula as to how we deal with people that are especially difficult or, you know, we just um, kill people with kindness. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so what so. was, what would you say was your biggest learning curve when you got into retail? Um, well, you know, again, as everybody's bringing it up, the money, you know, <laughs> like putting your own money into the business, um, that's what we did. We never had any investors. We haven't had investors. Um, the learning curve has been the money. Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, exactly. Cash flow. Yeah. So, Sian, why don't you um, talk a little bit about how it is that you're able to identify those brands that will work for Parigi that you think will then work at retail and what it's like to work with those individual brands and create distinct collections and relationships? Well, you know, you, you, I think it starts with knowing your company that you work with or you own, right? So you got to stay true to what you're good at, what you can really execute. Um, and I think if you're committed to that, then you try to find things that will complement what you do. So our company, we own a couple of brands and we license several brands. So each one of them are distinct. They don't cannibalize each other. So a lot of the times we try to find things that might be unique that would really fit into the white space that we have, that we're missing, uh, that we think maybe the retailer is missing. I think a lot of it has to do with, uh, is really shopping, is not getting hooked into this. It's remaining relevant to human contact. You got to get out there. You got to speak to people. You got to build relationships. You got to go to stores. You have to shop. You have to see companies, what they, what they put on the floor for the price, how they translate a brand. And you have to see what's missing. You know, we started our business back in 81. And when you used to go to retailers back in then, because the retail landscape was really different, right? So, you know, the Macy's of the world weren't cool, right? And, uh, you know, discount retailing was a big thing here in America, right? So you had, you know, the people like, they're not around today, but James Way and Caldors and Bradleys and all these people that used to be around. And it was a very discount promotional environment, right? So, I mean, back then, you could just maybe go to a buyer with a sample case and you can try to show them what you have. But most of the time, you know, you were competing against a million other people. And, you know, they were looking for something different. And the onus was on you. And I remember distinctly one day going to Target one day years ago. And, you know, the buyer just turned around to me and said, you know, you got to go to my store. You know, you got to see what I'm missing. Tell me what I'm missing. 
So I think that's how it really started for me, is trying to find out what I can bring to that retailer that would be distinct, because it really opened up my eyes to not only the competition that we have in our industry, right? Okay, you know, Lisa and I are colleagues, but you know, we could be up against each other on certain retailers which, at certain times, certain departments. But I think the retailers have competition, right? Because you guys as shoppers, you know, you create the destination. So each retailer is looking to build that relationship with you. So they need to have something meaningful on the floor. And they want something that, you know, Kohl's wants to have something on the floor that Penny doesn't have. You know, Macy's wants to have on the floor what Dillard's or Belk doesn't have. Certainly Walmart wants to make sure that whatever they have, Sears and Kmart don't have. So... And that's what you have to do. So you have to build. So I go out there and I try to look for, I think, brands that might be out there in adults, might be out there in handbags or footwear. I think that's where brands really start, right? You know, so they either start from fragrance, they start from footwear, they start from clothing, or they start from handbags. I mean, so you got to find who doesn't maybe have kids, who could be relevant in kids, you know, and you got to be sure that you really can define that when you approach them. Then you have to find out the retailer that would be a good home with. So there's a lot of work that goes into it. You know, I, I, you, know you made the comment before about knowing every phase. You know, all of these women have, have done everything with their hands. And it just, that's what it takes. And I think starting from the kids, it might not be as prestigious as working for a woman's company or a well-known men's company. But, you know, if you're young enough and if you're patient enough and if you're ambitious enough... I think you start at the bottom, and kids is not the bottom. Kids is where everything starts. Everything starts. Everything really starts with design, but everything starts in kids. Because what you're doing is, if you can learn the process of how something is, how, how a concept comes from a product development calendar, from conceptual all the way to you deliver the store, and all the steps that go in between, designing kids, doing product selection, SKU plans, making the goods overseas, bringing it in, selling it during market week, selling it to retailers, seeing it ship, seeing it sell through. If you understand the process, you're more credible and you really appreciate it because you're cultivating that next generation. That's really what you're doing. So if you spend a few years and you in one place, as long as you're moving on a path that's up, it's always good to move around. I don't, I don't get discouraged when seeing resumes with people that have a few jobs. As long as I see a pattern of where they're going. If it looks like they're going around in a circle, I'll see you later. But if it looks like that you're progressing, if there's a method to your madness of how you're moving up, I get it. And I think if you go from kids and you go to young men's and juniors and from there you go to men, and if you go, you know, eventually you become, you become valuable. And so I think brands at the end of the day, you find the right brand and you just commit yourself to it. Try to make sure that you're delivering a product that's not on the floor. You have, comp you have competition all day long. Lisa's up against a million people that make woven shirts, right? When you think of Tommy, you think of certain classifications. You know, how does she reinvent something every season? It's amazing, yeah. right? Is it a color? Is it a trim? Is it just a, is it a stitch? Is it a button? Is it a wash? It's crazy. And that's, that's a great, I mean, that's, it's a lot. It's a lot. And she has to do it, and all of them have to do it in every size range and age. Young men's and juniors, men's and women's, we're all grown up. We pretty much stay the same shape, give or take. We're not really growing, right? You go buy something, it's SMLXL or whatever the hell it is in kids. There's everything. There's newborn, layette, infants, toddler. I mean, it, it's a lot. So if you can master that, you can do anything, mm -hmm. anything. Well, that's a good point because um, one of the trend professors here at Parsons mentioned to me recently that for her final project that she gives her students, it's not a children's wear class. Um, she has them translate the trends into children's wear because it is a challenge, because you have the sizes and the different, you know, designing for an 18 month old is not the same as designing for a six year old and how you would translate that trend from baby to an older kid is important. So that's a good point. So now I'd like to hear from each of you to talk a little bit about the skill sets it takes for you to do the job that you have, including, you know, kind of maybe some things that might be more obvious and some things that might be more soft skills that people wouldn't realize. There's a lot of interpersonal stuff that goes on, I know, with all of your, all of your different jobs. Brona, you were saying, you know, having to deal with those customers that come in and they're unhappy whether you did something wrong or not and you have to be able to finesse that. So maybe you can start and talk about, you know, what the skill set is for you, you as, a, as a retailer that owns a store, but then also when you're hiring people, what are you looking for? 
Um, <clears throat> let's see. Um, well, I think when I'm hiring people, I'm in the process now of, um, I, luckily we've, um, we don't really go through staff that much, you know, we don't have a high turnover and the girls that have worked with me usually stick around for three, you know, for as long as you can take a retail job, which is three to four years, I think, and then you're burnt out. Um, but I, the girls usually stay with me th about, you know, for four years or whatever. Um, and right now I'm having a little bit of a turnover and, you know, it's like a morning phase also like having people go because it you know everything tends to end on good terms um but what i look for is um um i you know i always feel like you can't really tell but like when i hire someone i usually bring them in on a month's trial period because you can't really tell until someone you know you see them in motion and you see how they handle customers, you really, you really, really don't know, you know? Um, you can go on a resume, you can call people, but I think for me, I have to see someone in action. Um, and that's kind of what I base things on. And, you know, just consistency and credibility and how they do handle, handle the customers and how authentic people come across when they're handling customers. And I can only base that on seeing them in, you know, in the role of being in the store, you know? Um, if someone comes in five minutes late and smelling of smoke and all kind of lost in the neighborhood, obviously I'm not hiring that person. Um, and that happens a lot in Williamsburg. Um, you know, like they roll in from the last night's party. But, you know, I'm, I'm usually able to wrap that up in 30 seconds. Um, but uh, as far as like, my skill set in the store you know i just again i have to manage the personalities i have to deal with the vendors and that's you know growing i probably work with about 50 vendors now and i also have to deal with uh, hundreds of emails every day and you know being obviously having to be gracious to people because you know everybody <laughs> thinks what they're doing is special and everybody you know a lot i get a lot of emails because i i will try and look at everything because people come to me to look at their, whatever they're making to see if they, they want us to represent them in the store. And, you know, I, I am very picky, but um, I will look at everything and I will, it's not so much, oh, I think it's crap, I think it's really bad, or it's just, do I feel like this fits in my store, you know? Does this work with my vision and what I'm doing? And I base it on that, so, I, yeah, I'm dealing with the vendors, I'm dealing with the staff, um, customers that walk in because anyone can walk in to the store, so I tend to stay downstairs. Um, but um, yeah, I think it's just, you know, I'm just learning. It's a constant learning curve and I'm just learning that I, you know, I'm, things are growing and I just have to, um, you know, be nice. It's about being nice, but also asserting yourself and knowing knowing what you want and knowing your vision, basically. Right. And you mentioned buying and money before. So that's yeah. one thing people may not think about in terms of retail, but there's a lot of math in retail in terms of how yeah. much you have to spend and, yeah. and then how much you're making each month. Yeah, and I think also in the beginning too, I was, I had, I was totally blind to that. And I would just feel, you know, I, I would just base it on my gut and do I like this? Oh, yeah, I like it. I'll take 16, you know, $200 dolls. Um, and I'd manage to sell them, you know, like because I happened to have conviction and I, I could sell a plastic bag because I could make it look good in the store, I think. But, um, yeah, it's, you know, it's the money is a science and I'm learning that, you know, that's something <laughs> that you have to really, you have to get it broken down into a science and you have to control yourself because you can be like a shopper, you know, on the internet at night, but you're basically just buying at a trade show, you know? Right, <clears throat> right. So you gotta control those impulses also. <laughs> so Lynn Meyer, tell us a little bit about what it's like to be a sales rep. I know that's <laughs> definitely a role that has been evolving over the last few years. So tell us about kind of the skills that you are finding in yourself that you didn't know you had as things change. Well, a thick skin, um, definitely. Um, you know, <laughs> as a salesperson, 
Um, you face all kinds of challenges, and uh, you know, it's. Uh, I th I was very naive when I first started in sales. I thought if you open the door and you have nice things hanging there, people come and they buy, and it all was very pretty. <laughs> Um, it, it is uh, sometimes. Uh, other times it's not, and it is a challenge. Um, I think that um, uh, tenacity, definitely. Um, the desire to succeed, uh, ch uh, the ability to challenge yourself. I am strong with numbers, uh, coming out of a department store retailing background. Uh, so, um, <laughs> this year, last year, skills are pretty good. Uh, and sometimes those numbers work well, and sometimes they don't work so well. Uh, so you have to, since I work on straight commission, uh, you have to know how to budget the money. <laughs> you have to know how to live within your means. You have to know how to uh, be able to meet the payroll every week. And when the light bulb needs changing, you have to do that as well. Uh, the people that I look to hire are people who are positive, um, have the ability to speak uh, up, and uh, speak well and represent uh, my name that's on the door in a professional and polite manner and deal with all of the various challenges that come every day. And that can be everything from actually presenting a line to a customer to dealing with customer service problems, taking out the garbage, packing a box, unpacking a box, tagging merchandise, um, getting ready for a trade show, sitting on uh, with the telephone in your hand and making a hundred calls to buyers to try to get appointments. Um, it goes on and on. It's very, it's varied. Uh, so the challenges um, are individual with each challenge and um, with each task, I should say, that comes along. And um, during the course of a day, it can be all of those. <laughs> and uh, I think that's what makes it interesting, though. And uh, did I answer you? Yes, okay. you did. <laughs> so Lisa, uh, we, I'd like to have you speak to this as well, because I think what happens also, again, you know, we have our students here at Parsons. It's an amazing design school, but you see students from amazing design schools with amazing portfolios all day, every day. So Not how do you, day, a lot. right, so how do you <laughs> make the determination of who you would hire? Um, you know, it's, there's, there's a lot that goes into it, and and it's different at different different jobs I've been at. I mean, when I was um, when I was at Gap, you know, we had a bigger team. I was looking for um, you know maybe a very specific knitwear designer, so that was a different that was a different person that I was looking for. And now um, in the role I'm now, um, I have a very small team. We're lean and mean. I mean, we've, we we do a huge line, but we're really small, and so I need somebody who is grounded. I need somebody who can hit the ground running. I, I can't, we don't have time to train anyone. We just, we just don't. We move too fast. Um, so I need somebody who can hit the ground running, who's going to be able to take direction, somebody who's enthusiastic, somebody whose energy level is there, somebody who's organized and doesn't mind doing anything. I mean, everyone on my team has to pitch in. I mean, I have senior designers who hang samples. I have mm -hmm. interns who, you know, sometimes we'll have to go and talk to an executive. I mean, it, it, it's just a small team, and we need somebody who can, who can really jump in and, and do what they need to do, and do it humbly, and, you know, with a good attitude. And then there's the practical part where I'm actually looking for somebody, as a brand representative, somebody who works for Tommy Hilfiger. I have to look at your portfolio, and students' portfolios look all different kinds of ways, and I have to determine from that portfolio if I think you can design into the Tommy Hilfiger look. And that, you know, a lot of times is a deciding factor. I mean, a lot of times, you know, somebody's great technically, somebody's an amazing on Illustrator, or somebody, you know, has all the right parts, and then I say, I just don't think they get the brand aesthetic. I'm sorry, guys, like, I, I don't think they're gonna get there. You know, my designers may, oh, we love them, they're great, Lisa, get me here. I don't think they're gonna get there, <laughs> you know. Like I don't think they get it. Like I don't, I don't think they get who we are. Right. So you need somebody, and I don't, you know, it's it's not what you look like; it's how you see. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, we have our team is so varied, and and they come from all different places and all different, um, and all different 
directions and personally, you know, their aesthetics, you may look at them and be like, this is a crazy bunch. They don't look like Tommy, <laughs> but they all get, the, they all know how to design for a Tommy. Right. They know how to solve the problem. And that's really what we're looking mm -hmm. for. So Charlotte, you mentioned that you have had a lot of different roles within Children's Wear. So help our students out and tell them maybe, are there certain things that you wish you had learned in school, certain classes that you wish you had taken or paid more attention to if you did take them? Yeah, I, um, I actually went to school and I did um, three-dimensional design, which <laughs> is a bit far from where I am now. But um, so I was, basically it's like fine art sculpture, um, then I came and worked for Lulu Guinness and I did retail, so I had that background. Then I worked for Cynthia Rowley and did wholesale. And then I started with Lucy Sykes and got more into the production and the design side, which was where I wanted to be. Um, we did everything, we hand sketched everything. We, um, you know, I got a lot of experience going out to the factories. The grading was a big issue, that's always a tricky one. So I actually, I saw the problem there and I went to evening class and I learned the grading myself um, and I took, went to evening class as well, I did Illustrator, I did knitwear design, I took a lot of other classes once I knew that this was where I wanted to be and I think that's the most important thing is you never ever stop learning, you always need to keep yourself current, learning new technologies that are out there and try and, for me I need to offer my client a really broad range of things so that I'm always relevant to them, you know, I mm -hmm. do graphic design, I can do, you know, I do CADs, I do technical, like the whole right. thing. And I think that makes you more um, valuable to your client mm -hmm. if you can offer them as much as possible. Okay. Well, I'd like to open it up if any of you have questions. Anyone in the audience that has questions? Um, we have a microphone here. You can have one of these. Yeah. <laughs> we have one here. And Francesca will bring it to you. Hi. Should I stand up? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, well, um, thank you for all this uh, discussion. Uh, I have a children wear a brand uh, based in Williamsburg, Brooklyn, um, me and my partner. And I wanted to know first, um, I seen that the two to eight size is the most popular. Uh, I wanted to know why, and I w I'm wondering, because we do like everyday wear, but in a more like not the typical jersey, t-shirt, sweater thing, but a little more woven fabrics and a little more um, dressy, but functional and playful. And I wanted to know who um, buys. Um, I know it's the mother, the grandmother, the uncle, the aunt, but who buys and what buys, and also, um, we do keep everything local, like we make everything in New York. Maybe we'll expand to made in the USA, but I, I want to know like how special that is, if that it's a plus in a brand to keep it locally made. Okay, so, so let's tackle the size range first. Um, does anyone have any opinions in terms of size ranges? I mean, I always typically think of baby as being the most kind of insulated size range because you have gift givers in terms of the, who the mm -hmm. consumer is. Yes. And they don't care about price, they just want it cute and they are headed to a shower and they need it now. So that makes them fantastic for us. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but what about the two to eight size range? I, they grow. Mm -hmm. yeah. They, they're const that age span, they're constantly outgrowing their clothes. But why is it more popular than babies and or upper than eight years old? Because you can also, uh, I, I, yeah. sorry, I yeah. think that age group you can, um, you know, I, I have a seven year old son, I can't tell him what to wear really. Mm -hmm. And my two year old daughter, I can't tell her what to wear. And my son stopped wearing what I wanted him to wear when he was about five, you know. So it's it's the chill, you know, it you depends on what kind of you can still control what yeah, yeah. The parents you still the buyer. It, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. you know, so the kid the kid doesn't want to shop at a children's wear store after a while, you know. No. So the right. mother can drag the kids to go shopping, right? So but after a certain age the kid has their own opinion, right? Yeah. And mm -hmm. They wanna they see commercials, they have their own look, they wanna they want something. Sorry, like yeah? what sells the most? Like we make 
from dresses to bubble shirts and we love to make we want to make it give a value for what they're buying right mm -hmm. because it's a little more expensive than if they buy a t-shirt but then we make reversible pieces and separate so they can mix and match with their own basic mm -hmm. so sometimes i see um that people don't want to like spend an amount of money uh, because they're going to grow. We make sizes that will grow with the, with the kids, like mm -hmm. from two to three or from two to four or, you know, five to, you know, they will grow in like at least two sizes. But I wanted to know, um, like what sells the most and who buys it? Well, in the size range uh, that can you're Can I answer that just about, for a second? Sure. Boys wear t-shirts, jeans, sweatshirts. Most of the times, tracksuits. Now, when you get a, girls could be very simple too. It could be a great legging, right? It could be a great jean, um, knit top, you know, maybe a three-quarter dress, a good dress. Those are everyday pieces that they're gonna wear. So the, the special occasion that might come up where they're gonna need to wear something that's unique and the parent might wanna shell out the money for it, you know, if, if that's the business that you're in, then you're gonna have to be patient because you've gotta find that customer, right? That's just what it is. So. You know, if you want to expand the line to carry things that could sell more every day, but the special occasion stuff, you're waiting for a particular customer. You know, most of the time, the business that we're in, if it's the younger sizes, I classify the shopper as the five minute mom. She's got five minutes. So she better understand what's on the floor. You know, if it matches, if it's a relatable separate, if it's a set, just make sure that it's something that hits them in the face it has the value with it, and she's gone, because she doesn't have the time. Other questions? Yes. Um, can you hand her the mic, please? Thank you. Hello. Um, I would like to get into the plus size uh, market, and I would like to find out if you guys could give me any information about that. Kids plus. Children's? Sure. Like huskies and so forth. Yeah. yeah. Mm. It's, it's a great niche. idea. Yeah. It's, a, it's yeah. wide open. There's it nobody is. doing it. <laughs> yeah, it is open. Um, it's not an easy one to do um, on the specialty level. Um, so I say go for it. <laughs> yeah, what I've heard about that is it's very difficult to get retailer buy-in. Mm. Like the customer is obviously out there. Out there yeah. We can see that, right? But That's one of those direct-to-consumer situations. Yeah, yeah but it's hard to get retailers. Uh, E-commerce site e that was yeah. doing mm -hmm. um, yeah. like plus size for kids. Mm -hmm. I think it would be a knockout. Other questions? Yes. Hey, thank you all. Uh, my partner and I are starting, our backgrounds are international development, film, and economics, so a little bit different than your specifics, but um, <laughs> combined. Um, however, we'd like to do, we're, we're starting a social entrepreneurship kind of angle, so we've got some really awesome um, production houses that we're starting to work with in Africa and then we'd like to expand and we're sourcing our textile also in these places. Is there interest in that sort of thing just based on all of your backgrounds? Yeah, if, I'm, if I'm understanding your question, I might not be, but are you, are you asking if there's interest in this products coming from the specific countries that you're not necessarily the country, but just the idea that it will be made by. Oh, like, like women cooperative somewhere. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's definitely, you know, that exists. It's around. Yeah, of course. It's not around. And, um, there is an interest in it, I, I think, you know. It's There's a customer for that. Yeah. I will say that what often happens when people approach me with ideas like that, what I remind them is, it still comes down to the product. Yeah. So you can have the best backstory in the world, but if the product isn't what people want to buy, then it doesn't matter. So that's what I would caution. But yeah, I mean, it definitely can work. And there is a customer that wants to know that story and wants to know that they're supporting people. Yes. Thank you for your, for your discussion. Uh, I have a brand of men's and boys luxury swimwear. And uh, I have a question, why are parents willing to pay more for girls than for boys? We all have that question. <laughs> <laughs> it's 
that um, bad, isn't it? Isn't that bad? I mean, I don't. Yeah. Th- I mean, I don't know. I think it's just that there's way less, um, there's way more competition in girls than there is in boys, and there's way less companies doing interesting boys wear. Mm -hmm. And so, like, we, our company is predominantly boy, and we have, you know, like, uh, our sales are definitely leaning way more towards boy. And so, obviously, if you figure out the formula, it works, and people will spend. I mean, we, you know, have you know, very expensive garments for boys and mid-level, and we have no trouble selling either. But I think so. in the specialty area that you're in of swim, yes, it's a, it's a one-season item. It's something you can get competitively yeah. priced very inexpensively. I mean, they're only going to wear it for three, three Absolutely. months. Absolutely. Right? Mm-hmm. Swim. Yeah. So mm-hmm. I think that's a really difficult mm-hmm. area to get a, a good price on, mm-hmm. unless you're a, you know, French and yeah. French Riviera or something. Yeah. Some it's resort, super basically. important when you're starting with your concepts. Obviously, dream big and think about where you want to go, but you have to think about what the market needs and what they'll spend on. And, um, you know, when you had mentioned that you're doing a lot of wovens, I mean, kids' clothing are it's made in Jersey for a reason. That's what kids want to wear. Wovens are difficult to sell. Kids don't want to wear wovens. Mom doesn't want to iron clothing. She doesn't want to dry clean clothing. She, and, she, and it's just not, it's not what they're drawn to. And exactly what he said, boys, they want track pants. They want soft cotton pants. I mean, obviously you can, they'll wear jeans and they'll wear cotton twills, but you're going to, for every cotton twill you spend, you sell, you'll sell five soft, you know, jersey pants. And so it's just, you've got to think about where you're going to, where, how much resources you're going to put into a garment that may or may not sell. So you have mm-hmm. to think about where the market, what they need. Just talk on the price. You know, the, the price is going to cost a little bit more because, you know, in, in our market, you know, boys care about brands. Girls care, they care about trend. Uh, you know, I don't care if you're a girl or if a woman. If you find a pair of jeans that fits you, I don't care if it's seven or you found it at Walmart. If it fits, you're buying it. So mm-hmm. trend speaks and you're going to pay for that if it's worth it to you. And, and girls, there's a lot more detail that goes into girls, women's, than men's most of the time. So you're paying for the fabric, you're paying for the detail, you're paying for the applique, you're paying for the embroidery. Um, you're just paying for the special look of it. So it's worth it. It just, sometimes it just adds up. It just adds up, it does. I mean, boys are a lot simpler. You know, to answer your question before about Brooklyn, I mean, people care if it's made in this country, but I think they care more if it's affordable. <laughs> so, you know, that's really what it, it's, a, it's disgusting, but that's really what it's come down to, more than ever. I mean, the last six years, I think all of us in business, whether they're in business 30, 40 years, or just 10, 15 years, I mean, this cycle is just, it's unforgiving. It's really horrible, because it's all about price now, and it's so hard. Mm-hmm. So there's no bottom, so you're either gonna be somebody that's gonna be the top of the tastemakers, the triangle piece where you're going to keep something up, you know. All of a sudden, you know, 10 years ago when that $79 jean at stores started exploding, you had people like, you know, Diesel and, you know, Seven raising their prices from a buck 29 to 229 for no reason. They just wanted to protect the coolness of their brand. So everything is priced now. So it's, it's a challenge. It's just really a challenge. People want value every day and, and this is making it worse you know yeah. it just it's just driving things down so it makes it harder for everybody here to try to be different on designing something every single season with the same pretty much classifications the same silhouettes shipping the same retailer it's just it's tough it's tough we it could be done but it's tough we have a question in the front um, yeah. the, the mic is coming just <laughs> yeah we, you're right here <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Manufacturing in China or Latin America? Yeah. What's your insight? I mean, it depends on what you're making. Mm-hmm. Kids clothes. <laughs> Pardon? Um, like um, wovens, not, not wovens, um, jersey. Mm-hmm. Oh, um, go either. Yeah. Kids clothes. Simple. Bringing it here? I mean, there's benefits, there's pros and cons to both mm-hmm. um, locations, but I mean, if you're doing like, Pima cotton and whatnot. I mean, 
Latin America, it's, it's, I mean, if you speak the language and there's no time change, I mean, there's so many benefits, it's easier to get to. I mean, there's, you know, there's certain, Colombia, there's no, I think there's no duty for it to land. So there's definitely ben tons of benefits going down there. But if you're doing like woven outerwear, you know, uh, athletic gear, all that, it, they don't have the capabilities to do that down there. So it all depends on what you're making. China wins most of the time because they can produce so quickly. Mm -hmm. I mean, they got it down to a science. So and they're just, you go to some, their resources you go to some are much right, greater. Their resources are so much greater, mm -hmm. and they're, they're more dependable. So it's hard. I mean, everybody would like to spread the love around all these other countries, but some of them are just unpredictable. You know, it could be civil unrest. It just could be they're just not at that level industrialized, or mm -hmm. they can't meet up with compliance issues that we have to do. I mean, it's a lot of things. So, you know, sometimes it's, you know, it goes to China. But, but sure. it is true that it is uh, based on the fabrication and that yeah. will dictate, you know, yeah, like sure. Pima Cotton, like you said. Sure, 100%. Absolutely, that's the best. Mm -hmm. South America is the best mm -hmm. for that. Mm -hmm. But if it's other qualities, it, it's really the, the, the fabric, the fabrication that's you know, going to dictate. Where your base cloth is which, It's yeah. too expensive to ship base cloth yeah. to yeah. another yeah. country mm -hmm. to manufacture. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you have to get to a certain point before. Yeah. But there's always factories that are willing to, t I mean, like the factory we went with was willing to take a chance on us, and we've grown with them. Okay. And, that relation and that's why their relationship has been able to maintain at such a great rate. But it's, um, you gotta, f there's always people willing to take a chance. People are always looking for new business. Nobody knows who's going to be, what's going to happen with anybody. You got to take a chance. Right. So we have one more question in the back. There you go. <laughs> so my question is, given how saturated the children's wear market is, what, in your opinion, are the main factors contributing to the success of an upstart children's wear label in the market today? Or does it boil down to that strong design concept, or would you say that there's sort of a huge component of it that boils down to kind of the funding and financial component? So that's sort of part one of my question. And part two is, um, you know, given that you have these sort of mass retails like Zara Baby and, and Gap Baby, um, how does a, a startup children's wear label compete at, at a lower price point, i.e. not in the luxury market, you know, given that landscape? <laughs> I'm not sure who to direct it to. Well, Lynn there. Meyer, would you like to speak, since you have multiple brands and you see new brands starting all the time, is there something that you can say like, this is what makes a brand last? Well, I will say this about it. Um, I, uh, competing on the lower end of the spectrum, I can't answer that at all because I don't deal on that uh, level. However, I will say that when we see new brands start, um, there are several components that help them. Um, but I will say that for everyone that starts, you know, um, the failure rate is high. Um, because of finances, it's always about the money, remember that. <laughs> um, and then um, also today, um, people, uh, we have a lot uh, at our disposal to help uh, promote new brands and social media um, is one of them. And uh, it's a very important component to starting uh, the demand for a product from the consumer level back to the retail level. Um, that is something that um, is almost essential today. Uh, it used to be the opposite. <laughs> You'd give a, a great line to a good rep and they'd go out there and they'd sell it to the stores and moms would come in or grandmas or whoever would come into the store and they'd say this great new thing and they'd go, oh my gosh, and the trend would start that way. No, doesn't work that way anymore. So um, I think that is very important to keep in mind when you're starting this brand. The other part I think that's been addressed very clearly is the demand for the product. Uh, what sets it aside, what makes it different? Is it already done? I mean, you can only, you have to, you have, to have a reason for being. And um, so those I think are very important things. 
Yeah, I mean, I think a clear vision is really important because as we have heard from the panel, there's not really that hole in the market necessary that's necessarily that someone's not doing this. So if you're going to do it, you have to know what you're about and who your customer is, market to them through all the channels that are available to you, including social media. And, you know, not to like beat a dead horse, but the finances are a big deal, you know, because you have to be in it for the long haul. It's not going to be the first season, it's a hit and you're rolling in cash. So you have to be in it for the long haul and you have to have the finances to build a team because you're one person and you can only get so far being one person. So that's something I see a lot as well. So I would like to thank our panel and thank you for coming.